No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. And today we have the one and only Estevan Oriol on the show. Yes, sir. How's How it you going? doing, man? Good. How about you? I'm very, very happy to be in here. I'm a huge fan of what you've done with your whole career and everything. Like I was watching the LA Originals documentary. It really stood out to me that you were on something that basically a lot of people seem to be on, but like 40 years ago, like you were just on to like what the fucking change in the culture was going to be so early and you were able to like capture so many unbelievable moments. And when I was watching that documentary, I just kept saying to my girl, I'm like, you see this? Like, this is why documenting everything is important because if you're somebody who actually, and I realize I'm just starting this interview with a rant, but uh, you know, if you understand the value of the, the culture and the art that's all around you enough to document it well, there's, I mean, that's just like a, a priceless thing. Like if all those photos didn't exist from that time period, uh, from that documentary and everything, like the world would be a lot worse off as a result. So uh, yeah, there's there's my rant about basically what got me so hyped uh, watching that documentary and basically just diving into your career and shit. Yeah, so you know, it's uh, when you're telling stories, you know, the the photos and footage is is showing you the facts. You know, otherwise it's just like, oh, he's telling a story. You know, but if you have photos and and footage or whatever, it's like there it is, set in stone. You know. Yeah. So there's no uh, you know no questions. It's like there it is. Right. And especially nowadays, it's like everybody seems to kind of get the value of documenting everything with everybody having their phones out and stuff. It's like everybody, you know, any rapper who's, who's got a thousand followers or whatever is like out here trying to do a photo shoot or trying to, you know, have some some content online. But like you got that such a long time ago that there was value in making this content within this subculture and, and really understanding the value of like hip hop and shit early on as well. Yeah, and the the difference between us back then that we're documenting it and what's happening now is it was quality over quantity. Mm. So like people just throw up out there, you know, mm. and and that's that's their content. Whereas we picked and choose every single piece that we wanted to be seen, like and the, and we're we're picking like what photos would go to what magazines, and you know who was. For a long time, uh, I was Cartoon's partner, but when press would come, he'd go, hey, you deal with that shit. Mm. So I would tell the magazines, hey, don't even worry about sending a photographer, just send the interviewer. And they'd be like, well, what do you mean? We're like, we don't want them taking pictures of us. So, you know, we we'll, we got that handle for you. And it, I had to show them that I was good enough to, you know, shoot for their magazines. But a lot of people would send photographers that we didn't like their, you know, we didn't like their photos. Mm -hmm. So we we were in a good position to where we could navigate and control what we we're letting the world see. So it's kind of cool because I learned that from tour managing House of Pain in Cypress Hill and also working with hip hop magazines that, you know, it was all about what the things that you pick is what people would see. You were, they were seeing it through your eyes. Right. And uh, I, I thought that was cool, you know, so I just brought that along the whole way of my career. So what was your introduction to photography in the first place? Because that that's like the number one thing that really stands out is that nowadays it's easy to take a, a, a good looking photo on your iPhone. But at that time, like to really be out there being a photographer was way more of a technical challenge. Like wh where did you begin to get interested in photography and get that knowledge? Uh, my pops put it, you know, put the camera in my hand and told me, you know, here's the basic, uh, the basics, how to use a camera. It was real simple. It took like five minutes to tell me what I had to do. And then it was just like, okay, you got the tool and I'll go use it. And it took a lot of trial and error, you know, cause back then you're shooting with film. So you never got to see the photo like within seconds. So oh, yeah. you would only see it three days later, three, four days later. So and if there was a weekend in there, you'd, it was five days. So I was I wasn't seeing anything that I was shooting right away, and I you know, I'd I'd have to wait a couple of days, and then I'd look at it and be like, oh okay, I messed up there, messed up there. You know, I'll try to do that better on the next one. And you know, to this day, I still am learn. You know, I'm still making mistakes and still trying to correct because I just get too pumped up when I'm working, and I get kind of excited in the moment, and I you know mess up and. It is what it is, you know. Have you ever, how much of your time do you spend shooting digital at this point, or are you all about film? 
I shoot uh, film for me, and I shoot digital for clients. Brands and shit, okay. Yeah, because they want their stuff the next day mm. or the end of the day, and and I don't really feel like there's a value to it, you know? I just, I'm like, okay, cool, here. Like, if I had it my way, I would give them a um, flash drive at the end of the shoot and just go, here, here you go, there's your pictures, you know? Because to them, they just want it like fast food, you know? Right. Like, all of a sudden, everybody's deadline is tomorrow. You know, back in the day, people used to plan, like, you'd, you'd plan, like, at the beginning of the month, like, we need to do the photo shoot in two weeks, we need to have have it, um, the selects and the edits done by this week, and then we're going to go to print this week. But now it's just like, hey, can you do this photo shoot? Yeah, when when do you want to do it? Tomorrow, we have a deadline. When's, when's the deadline? Well, it was tomorrow, but, you know, we'll push it another day, you know? So it's uh-huh. kind of like, it's crazy, you know? It's, it's uh they want everything so quick and so fast but you know i get it you got to keep up with the time so i keep the film for me and i give them the digital stuff right do you but is it hard for you to care as much when you're shooting something digitally is like is it is it always going to be a compromise in your mind or have you come around to enjoying it in a certain way no it's a it's a compromise for sure because mm. I, I i don't feel like the it's the same look like whenever i, I do a photo shoot I I uh, I go okay yeah here's your photos and I keep my little films and then I develop them and I get them back and I'll be looking at those digital photos for a couple of days to get them ready to send them off to them but then when I get the film back I'm like damn man I wish I could have mm. I wish they could have got this or I wish they would have put that in the budget you know in the in the time you know put the time in the in the deadline you know like hey let's take a couple extra days so we can get that film look but. Nowadays, people don't even see the difference, you know, because they're so used to seeing every photo on a on a iPhone that when you most of the time when you're shooting with an iPhone, everything is bright in colors and everything is crystal clear in focus. Whereas when you shoot with film or you have a style, like I try to shoot um, whatever I'm shooting in focus and then everything in the background out of focus. So your focus is on that person or that thing. Right. And with these things, it's kind of like everything, you know, you just shoot and it is what it is, you know? Yeah. No, yeah, that definitely I've like witnessed that in my life because it's like when I was in high school, we were in photography class and stuff. We were shooting with film cameras and then all the photographers that I was around on the BMX shit all through up until I guess like 2005, 2006 was when people really started to transition to shooting uh, digitally and to like watch that transition and how much that changed the game. And even like 2005, 2006, that's when if you wanted to, like you couldn't take a good camera phone photo at that time. So it was like yeah. very much like a weird in between stage in photography where you could shoot great digital stuff but not everybody was able to do it. Now it's yeah. everybody's got the phone, and a lot of people don't really see the value in shooting on something different. Yeah, and then it seems like uh, most of the time when people are shooting digital photos, it's like by the end, by the time you get the photo of you know from the digital uh, from the camera, it's probably about fifty to eighty percent you know uh digitally manipulated after you know after the photo has been taken so it's kind of like to me it's kind of like well that's not really a photo you know it's like a photo and then all the editing you did to it Mm. whereas when you shoot film you you get what you get you know and then you put in the dark room and there is some little bit manipulating with the light like the exposure but for the most part, you can't really like take out a light pole from behind the head and, you know, switch this eye because this eye is not, you know, this eye was a little bit more closed. And you don't really edit your photos in Photoshop after? No, okay. I don't like to. I like to just take good pictures, you mm-hmm. know, so that I, you don't have to do all that. It seems like, you know, hours of time to try to make a picture good. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you just spent a little bit of time before that and just took the good picture, then you don't have to do all that. For sure. Okay, so take me back to your younger days. Like when you talk about uh, road managing, House of Pain and shit like that. I mean, those are like the like at Cypress Cell, that was like music for me when I was in second, third grade, etc. Those were like some of the groups I was listening to the most. What led you to be in that position to be on the road with them and shit? How did you get into that like so early on in hip hop's history? 
Yeah, well, I was working at the the doors at the hip hop clubs, and then I would uh, DJ or or work the door at the underground clubs, af- the after hours clubs. Oh. So that's how I met everybody in the game, because back then everybody used to go to you know the same. There was like cool clubs that everybody went to, whether you were a celebrity or a street dude or in the music game. So. I was the doorman, so I saw everybody coming in, and you know, I'd take care of people, you know, that I knew, and uh, you know, because there was always the line, and this guy didn't get in, that guy didn't get in, so I'd always see, you know, certain people, and I'd be like, hey, you know, come through, you know, I got you, and one of those people was Muggs from Cypress Hill, and we became friends, and then he took me down to the block to Cypress Ave, I met B and Sin, that was in '89, and then. Uh, after hanging out for a little while, like in 92, he was like, hey, I, I got a job for you, you know, if you're if you're down. Because at that time, I was working the door at night and doing construction during the day. <coughs> and um, You were basically working your ass off, it sounds like. You were doing something every hour of the day. Yeah. It, it hasn't changed, you know. Yeah. It's still going. But Muggs hit me up to do this job, which turned out to be the tour manager of House of Pain. And what did you know of House of Pain at the time? Because they went on to be huge, but at that time, were they not? No, they they hadn't started yet. Oh, okay. And uh, I had only known Everlast from when he was part of Rhyme Syndicate and he'd come to the clubs. So I hadn't met Danny Boy or Lior yet. And uh, me and Muggs and Everlast met up and they explained the job to me. They're like, hey, you know, you don't get paid at first, but we'll take care of you. We got all your flights, your hotels and per diem. So I was like... All right, you know, I'll try it for the summer. And uh, I told both my bosses, hey, if this don't work out, is it cool if I come back? And they go, hell yeah, you're one of our best guys, you know? So yeah. it was all good, you know? I got, I went on that trip and I never came back because uh, Jump Around took off and that was it. It was over, you know? So you watched that happen while you were on the road of that song yeah. going from nothing to probably one of the biggest songs of, the, of that era. Yeah. It, it, <clears throat> we I saw it from nothing, you know? From like you know the the demo tape and um, we'd go to do shows and stuff and the the first demo the first dat tape that we had was uh, seven minutes and it was uh, the intro was like the House of Pain intro and then it went into Jump Around mm. and that was our show for the first few uh, first few months like if we'd go to clubs and do you know just like a a one off type thing and then even that I think that was the same tape that we used for the Beastie Boys right tour that we did and um, then the shit just went bananas, you know. Every radio station picked it up, and you know we started getting on. We got kicked off the BC Boy tour, and then we got on our own tours. Wait, why'd you get kicked off that tour? Uh, the tour manager of BC Boys, uh, we we came to a show where Everlast Mom was gonna be, and he put her up in the nosebleeds, up in the grass, because <sighs> at that time we were playing arenas. Right. And he was like, "Hey, uh, you know, go put go put the tickets at the door." So I was like, "Yeah, no problem." I put all the tickets that were on the guests at the door, and he's all, hey, man, my mom's up there in the grass. And I go, oh, you know, that ain't right. You know, let me go talk to him. And the guy was like, hey, it is what it is, you know. So basically, like, the Beasties needed the, the tickets, you know, the good tickets for their people, and we are the, the lowest band on the on the billing. Right. So we got the shit tickets. And I told Everlast, I go, hey, he said it is what it is, you know. So he goes, oh, fuck that shit. He went in the in the uh, in the production office and gave him a piece of his mind. And the next day, we were off the tour. Wow! Did that seem like a huge L at the time, or you guys just like fuck this? We don't need that shit. No, it seemed like you know, <laughs> like because we were thinking, you know, the Beastie Boys they're known for being crazy and wild, and like we we're like, there's no way you can get kicked off a, of a tour with those guys, you know? Like mm. there, you, we weren't that wild and crazy, you know, but. Obviously, we were wild and crazy enough to get kicked off, and uh, we were like, fuck, now what? You know, we called our manager and we called the agent. They are like, hey, you know what? It's kind of better because uh, we can throw you on some other tours. The record's taking off, and we're getting calls, and, you know, you know, keep your bags packed. Right. So we, it was off and running. You know, we just went on, went crazy and doing tours where we had, like, corn before they were known open oh, wow. up for us and rage against the machine before they were known open up for us and you look back on that now and you're like damn fucking rage against the machine and right. 
porn were opening, you know, up for us, and we were just like a rap group, you know. Did they even seem like? Would you have ever thought that Corner Rage would have gotten the the level of success that they got to at that time? When you see them play live, you 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 see it, you know, you get it because you're like, man, you know, because you feel it. Yeah. Like it's one thing, like when you got a a hip hop show and there's like the dap machine going mm-hmm. and there's some live scratching, but it's nothing like when you have like you know the guitar, the bass, the amps, and just everything just so loud and so crazy. Yeah. And it's like, you're like, damn, you know? And if, and, it, and if it sounds good and they perform good, you're just like, fuck, they're gonna win, you know? You could see right off, right at the gate, you know? Definitely. Every band has its own, like, uh, touring style. Like, some bands are crazier than others. House of Pain's, like, whole image was very much like a hard party and beer drinking type of thing. Was that how it was? Did you get a lot of sleep on that tour or was it different than it was kind of marketed to be? Uh, no, I, I, I don't even think it was like marketed like that. I think they just saw how we were. Yeah. And like, if you, when I think back on it now and look back on it now, we were kind of crazy and we were kind of wild, you know? It, it, like it definitely wasn't just beer drinking, you know, partying type of shit you know we were going buck wild and uh like some of the stuff that you know we got to do and places that we got to go and people that we got to kick it with it was just like it was overwhelming sometimes you know It it was uh it was crazy to see legendary groups that you grew up watching or that you know you would go home and you were bumping in your radio and then all of a sudden you're on tour with them and you're like damn man you know we're on tour with these dudes and you kicking it with them every day for a couple months and everybody's kicking it with each other on their each other's buses and smoking weed and drinking and just having like the time of their life and you're like fuck man you know this is straight up like rock star shit and my pops was like you have a cool lifestyle you know like you're you're living like a rock star doing this rap thing and then when you come home you're in east l.a doing the low riding thing with your car club like you should be documenting this shit yeah so i was like I'm down, you know. So at first you weren't taking photos on those tours, and then it sort of started to occur to you, like, w- were there no photographers on tour for the most part? No. There wasn't, not like now, you know, where everybody's walking around, the, they have their own videographer yeah. and their own cameraman catching content every day, editing it for the social media that night or the next day, and there's none of that. You know, I was like, I had a camera... People used to look at it almost like I was pulling out a gun or something, you know? <laughs> They're like, what the fuck, you know? I was like, yeah. But when you when you kick it with people enough, they get comfortable and they're like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, that's the homie who takes pictures, you know? But yeah. at first people would be like, oh, shit. You know, like you're doing anything fun or cool or crazy. The second a camera comes out, they're like, uh-oh. Mm-hmm. You know, so now it's the opposite, you know? Now it's like people bring shit out and do shit just because there will be a camera there, you know? Right. So times have changed. And how, how did you actually meet Cartoon? Because, I mean, that's that's what's kind of crazy is that nowadays, like, the thing to do as a tattoo artist, or not, not, not for everybody, I don't want to throw this on everybody, but there's tons of tattoo artists that are just basically trying to tattoo rappers, tattoo celebrities, and use that as a way to get bigger. Cartoon figured out that that was a, a good way for him to get his shit out there so early on. And, like, same thing with you and photographers. Like, now yeah. if you're a photographer and you want to get on, what do you do? You got to get some popping new rapper to let you take photos of him. But you guys figured that out so fucking long ago. So how did you meet Cartoon, and how did you figure out that you guys were on the same wavelength in that regard? Um, well, I had a homie, Donnie, rest in peace, uh, Donnie Charles. At that time, he was a manager of WC in the Mad Circle, and he had a car club called Hood Rat Rec- or uh, Hood Rat Car Club and he had a record company called Hood Rat Records and he used to put out mixtapes like East Side versus West Side, you know, over down South Central and that and like Coolio and WC and all these rappers were on it and um he was a good friend of mine. We'd go to clubs together, we'd go low riding together and all that. And then we went to a a penthouse players party and Cartoon had done the album cover. So when I walked in you know, with Donnie, he was like, oh, hey, man, there's there's another one of my Mexican homies right there, you know, come over and meet him and you guys can kick it. Because at that time, like, the hip-hop scene was kind of like, it was mostly, like, African-American. There were a couple of white guys that worked at the labels or in the management. And then there was a couple of Latinos that, you know, were in that, in that industry. Mm-hmm. 
So he right away seen cartoon. He's like, oh, that's the homie right there. You know, he's an artist and he low rides and, you know, got to go, go over here and kick it with him because, you know, we didn't, we didn't really know nobody there. So we rode over in cartoon and then um, we went to an X-Clan party after that. And uh, I think Donnie, Donnie was going to get into some beef or something that he had with somebody. And the only two people with him were, you know, were me and Cartoon. And he was like, you know, he, once he seen that, like, we were down with him like that, he was like, hey, man, we're two of the only people that ever got invited to his house where his family was. He was like real private kind of guy. Uh-huh. He was like, man, you know, I don't let a lot of my homies come and know where I live. And the motherfuckers can meet me at the gas station. And I was like, well, okay, you know, but he just saw that we were down for, you know, down for ours and we were down for him. And ever since when, when me and Cartoon met at first, I had just come back from Japan touring with House of Pain and he was going there to Mural Lowriders. Uh-huh. And uh, we just started chopping it up about that. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to Japan. And I was like, oh, I just got back from there. And he's like, for real? And yeah. I and at that time, up. having been to Japan probably seemed a lot more out of yeah. the ordinary. I mean, it's still pretty out of the ordinary, but... Nobody was doing that shit, you know? Yeah. So, like, especially two Mexican homies from L.A. Exactly, yeah. Ball-headed, tattooed. Like, they that, they weren't going to Japan. There was, you know, nothing to go there for. You had everything here. Yeah. So, when I told him, yeah, I just got back, and I had a, a promo tape with me with the first single, with Jump Around, and one other, like, the intro... And I gave him the tape. I go, hey, homie, check this out. You know, this is this band I'm starting to work with. And he goes, oh, okay, cool. And he said he played it, and uh, right away he got it. You know, he's like, damn, that shit was hitting hard, you know. So when he came back from Japan, we kicked it some more, and then, you know, we just started kicking it and hanging out. And in 94, I left uh, House of Pain broke up, and I called up, you know, the Cypress Hill guys, and I was like, hey, man. These dudes are done touring, you know, and I just wanted to call and thank you guys for the opportunity because, you know, I had a great time. Fuck, I toured the world and did all kinds of cool shit and thank you guys, you know. And I was going to go back and do construction and work at the doors again. And um, they go, oh, that's cool, you know, because our road manager just fucked up. So you can come and fill in that slot. And uh, they go, our first show is kind of like your uh, initiation. And... They're like, you got to get on a plane and fly to New York and meet Bobo. He's coming off the Beastie Boys tour, and you guys are going to meet up in New York and then fly to the show in a helicopter. It was Woodstock 94. So wow. That was my first show working with Cypress Hill. And, you know, we flew in with a Jefferson Airplane. Me and Bobo and two of the members from Jefferson Airplane flew in a helicopter backstage of Woodstock and, you know, flying over 500,000 people. I was like, fuck, man, you know? <laughs> like, I felt like I made it, you know? I was like, damn, look at me, you know? I'm in a fucking helicopter flying with these two dudes and going in the backstage of Woodstock, and that shit was, you know, unreal. Yeah, it sounds like it all happened very abruptly for you. Yeah, it was going it was going pretty fast, and then once I, I got in good with them, uh, me and Cartoon had been working on different stuff together, and then I, I brought him into, you know, the Cypress Hill camp, and we started doing the album covers. He started tattooing them. And then I had already gotten tattooed by him. I was, like, the first one to get tatted by him because I was like, hey, man, all these dudes that are tattooing, they do it, like, as a craft, you know, like a plumber or whatever. They're just, like, pretty much tracing the drawings that are on the uh, on the wall. And Cartoon could flip it right out of his head. You know, you could tell a cartoon, hey, draw a lion, draw a lowrider, draw a fine girl, draw a Saturn. You know, whatever you could think of, he could just bust that shit out off a of memory in his head from, like, one time that he's seen it. Right. I was like, you need to start tattooing. So he started tattooing. And um, when I, after I got my tattoos, I showed them to, to uh, Cypress Hill. And then they started getting some of his tattoos. And then... By then, he was already, you know, deep in our crew. So I was, every time I'd go on tour, I'd, I'd meet, like, I think the first group was Goody Mob. I told them, hey, if you ever come to L.A., my boy will hook you up. You know, look, at he did all these tattoos on me, you know. He'll hook you up because, you know, you see some some people, they just go into any old shop and get, you know, let me get uh, number three on, 
right. on the B. On Especially the B back track. then. Like yeah. now people are a lot more literate when it comes to tattoos. Yeah, well, they got most plans. people still aren't. But like back then it was like nobody fucking knew shit. They were just going yeah. and get whatever. They are like, hey, give me the Black Panther yeah. you know, crawling up and shit like that. So I got one of them. When uh, <laughs> <laughs> when uh, when Toon started doing stuff, he was doing stuff out of the head, and I would show all these guys, you know, like Outcast and uh, Goody Mob and stuff. And so when they came to town right away, they're like, "Hey, you know, we want to get tattooed." And so we took him to South Central because at that time he was doing the the ice cream truck. And uh, we, my boy, uh, one of the homies had like a car wash, and that's where he was doing the the ice cream truck. He was muraling it. And uh, we brought uh, Goody Mob over there, and we had, you know, the tattoo set up right there, and he tattooed him right there at the car wash. And then uh, we we tattooed him at the pad, or we, we he got into a, a shop called the L.A. Tattoo on Hollywood Boulevard. And then, like, uh, 97, 98, he moved to Spotlight Tattoos on Melrose. Oh, yeah. And then the shit just went, blew up. Wow. That's crazy. Take me back a little bit. Why did House of Pain break up, and what was that like from your vantage point? Um, they just couldn't get along. Oh, you really? Know, like all three of them were always like you know, like brothers, you know, fighting over dumb shit, and um, and they just couldn't, you know, work it out. You know, it's three guys that, you know, like when when people start getting successful, they start thinking like, you know, I don't need the other guy, you know. I'm I'm I made it enough to where I can do my own shit. Yeah. Like you'll see other band members start other bands and you know they're like, "Oh, fuck, in case it doesn't work out with these guys, I got this backup plan, you know, with this band or some shit like that." So you know, it just got to the point where they couldn't couldn't do it no more. And, right. You know, be, it was, you know, sometimes it got kind of physical or shit like that and it was like, "Fuck this, you know. I don't need it." So then I was kind of bummed out, you know. I was like, right. "Fuck, man." Because especially know. your first band or group that you're associated with means more than all the other ones after that a lot of times because this is your first time experiencing success on that level, you know? Yeah. It was a trip because when they were, when we started doing shows, uh, we would they would book us like three shows in a night because it was seven minutes each time. So we'd go to three different clubs and pay, play the single. Right. And we'd have like a limo and they would drive us to the three different clubs or, or a van and I think the first fee that they started charging was a thousand bucks. So each night we'd go to three different places and get a thousand bucks. And it was always cash. So the guys would take 300 bucks each and then they'd give me the extra hundred. Oh. So I'm making like 300 bucks a day, which was cool. You know, I was like, fuck, this is great. You know, a couple of days a week. So I was like, damn, this is, you know, this is, gro this is popping, you know? Yeah. And then, um, when they started getting paid more shows than the the account, then they got the accountants going, and then those guys were like, "Hey, we need to put you on a salary." And the cool thing was, Everlast was like, "Hey, you know, we've been paying them this much cash off of shows, so we need to give them a good salary, you know." So he hooked it up, and uh, you know, he I, Everlast always took care of me, you know, as far as that was concerned. Like, I got into some shit, and I needed a lawyer. And he was like, "Hey, man." I got 50 racks on it. Fuck them. You know, and I was like, damn, you know, that's a homie right there. You know, like, yeah. I had to give five to the lawyer right off the bat. And luckily the shit didn't go nowhere. But he was like, don't trip, man. I got 50 on it. Fuck them. Wow. And I was like, cool. Thank you, brother. You that's know, that's crazy. So we had that kind of like brotherly love and respect for each other. Like there was one time where, you know, we used to roll around strapped because we were going to all these different places we didn't know Used nobody to? and the shit was you know not no more well you know <laughs> it's a it's a different world today you know it's true but um so uh you know and i was the guy carrying the money and shit okay. like that so i had to be you know because everybody knew the tour manager back then there, there was no wiring money and shit like that it's like you pick up cash every night so there was times where I had, you know, right. a couple hundred racks, you know, in my little briefcase. And I was, you know, I was an easy target. Mm. So um, there was one time where we went to the to check in in New York. And we went to the to the curb and went to do the curbside check in. Well, the the belt didn't work. So they walked all the bags up through to where you walk through it as, as a person. 
through the um, the metal detectors. And we were, we went to go get something to eat because we checked in. We had our boarding pass, and we're like, oh, cool, you know, we could take our time. We walk up, and there's like 20 cops by the metal detectors, and everybody's bags was there. And we're like, fuck, what the fuck's going on? You know, like this is a trip. Like, and he he goes, oh shit, I think I got you know one of the straps right there. And I was like, well. Whatever happens, you know, I'll just tell them that it's me and you guys go do the show. And, you know, because we don't that's we're not missing out on big money for this. You know, mm. we could deal with this later in the courts or whatever. So he was like, we'll see what happens, you know. So they go, whose bag is it? And I go, that's mine. And they go, OK, come right here. And when they seen him, he seen him arresting me. I was like, hey, man, you guys go do the show. You know, I'll, I'll kick it right here. Don't worry. I'll call the manager, whatever. Call the lawyer. You guys go ahead. You know, don't don't miss out on that money because of this. Mm. And um, I seen him like turn around a couple times to the, you know, on his way to the gate. And he's looking at me and he's like, "Fuck, man." He's like, ah, "Fuck that," you know. It's my bag. So then the cops were like, "Hey, why'd you lie?" And I'm like, "Hey, man, we're part of a, you know, music group. I'm the manager. They they got to go do the show. You know, I'm thinking about the business. Yeah, you know, we could." You can put me in the holding tank and the lawyer will get me out, no big deal. But I didn't want them to miss the show. And he goes, okay, I got you, you know. That's pretty stand-up of you, you know, to take the shit for your for your boy, you know. So that's the kind of shit that, that we did for each other, you know. Mm. And, uh, you know, that's just, we're like brothers, you know. We're, we're all part of a crew called the Soul Assassins. Yeah, yeah. And so it was like, you know, Cypress Hill, House of Pain, Funk Dubious, me and Cartoon. And a couple other, you know, dilated people, you know, Alchemist and and uh, Scotty Khan, yeah, you know, came up later on as the hooligans. So we were a pretty deep crew, and we had, you know, we were like a really tight family. Definitely. So yeah, when when you first started to be around Cypress Hill, though, what was your impression of them? Because you know, like I, I watched Be Real do his podcast or his interviews and stuff now and he's he's just like a, a, a cool ass dude but my impression of them when i was young was like these are some scary motherfuckers like when you first started going around them and stuff was it kind of like a different level than maybe what you've been used to i mean you're from la and shit so yeah. you've probably been around a lot of shit yeah it was you know just regular you know hood guys and you know b was banging back then so it's just like right. you know just another another homie banging in the hood and and uh you know they were they were like you know really in it you know so it was like the music was was the focus but it was like there's still like one foot in and you know one foot in in the music but then when the music started taking off everybody's like hey man let's leave all that other shit behind and let's go head on into the music you know this is we we can you know bring the homies in and they could all work with us and and we could help a lot of people like this you know from wherever we came from before you know so that was a a pretty cool thing that we got to you know i saw probably about 50 50 of the guys come through and you know we'd give them jobs and different stuff like that you know because a lot of the guys we knew they couldn't you know they're coming out of coming out of prison or something like that and couldn't go get a job, you know, right away. So they got felonies, and you know, as soon as you hit that felony box on the application, it's over. You're not getting the job. Right. So we had the kind of jobs that it didn't matter. You know, we weren't gonna do background checks. You know, on our own homies, we knew what you know. We knew what time it was. So we'd be, like, hey, you know, you're gonna be the the lighting guy. You're gonna be the you know the stage tech. You yeah. Know, you're gonna. Here's how you set this up. Here's how you set that up, and you set up the equipment you know we just had different homies around helping them out some of them it worked out with and some of them couldn't handle it and you know they took off you know but we tried you know right do you ever feel like you saw like the the downside to that in terms of trying to take your friends and put them into positions of, of having responsibility and shit because i've definitely seen that in my day yeah but you know that's what you're you're thinking of is as a family and as a crew you know you want to help your the people out around you, you know, you want to help out your homies, you know, I, I still try to help out a lot of people that I, I don't even know, mm. you know, but I, I just feel like when, if you're helping out people, then you got that coming back, you know, so I've, I've always been like that. And, 
it was no big deal for me. It was just like, oh, okay, cool. That guy didn't get it, but, you know, maybe this guy will. Right. You know, so there was a lot of people around, so, you know, it was easy to swap them out, you know. For you, sure. You can't handle it. You don't like to work. Well, fuck it. You're not going to just be riding the coattail, getting all the free shit and not do work, you know. We're working, so why the fuck aren't you going to work? Right. For so sure. that's how we were rolling. For sure. Uh, can I get my phone back once? Are they done with the... Yeah, all right. Just whenever they're done, let me let me get my phone back. I got some notes on there. But is this always the dream? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, did you? How, how long were you on tour with Cyprus? And were you tour managing slash doing photography that whole time? You're yeah. doing both concurrently. Yeah, the whole time. And then I started uh, directing videos. And so, I was on tour with House of Pain from '92, '93, '94. And then Cypress Hill from 94 to 2005. Wow. And then they didn't really want to tour no more. They wanted to take a break because, you know, that was a long run from 91 to 2005. So I had gotten enough, you know, traction with my photography and video career. And I was like, well, fuck it, you know. I don't have to go back and do construction and doorman shit. I'm going to go do photography and, and directing. Right. And that was, you know. That was, you know, from the, that point on, I never turned back and went back Be, on tour. Being on the road that much, did you start to hate it? Did you start to feel like this is, you know, it's like unbelievably exciting at first, but then you do it for a decade and all of a sudden it's like, you know, I, I feel like a lot of people can't really relate to the uh, the monotony of being on tour and just pulling up to the same cities over and over and sort of doing the same thing over and over. It's both incredibly exciting and super boring in a way were you starting to be like really over it by the end no for me it was kind of like uh you know that was my life you know yeah i had like i i didn't i felt comfortable being in a hotel or on the bus mm. you know so when i'd go home i kind of felt like weirded out you know like i know like there's no there's no comparison but i know that like i have vet friends that when they went away and went deployed and went to war when they came back, they felt like kind of weird back at home because right. there was like nothing going on. You know, they were like in limbo and they'd always want to go back, you know, and it, it kind of felt like that for me on, you know, with the touring. Like I'd be traveling and going to all these cool places, living a five star life style, you know, eating good restaurants and having these cool rooms and shit to come home. And then I'm back in like, you know, stationary mode, you know, yeah. kind of felt like. I'd come back and my, my life would just like be waiting till the next tour. Yeah. Because there's a weird thing that happens to you when you're at home where you keep seeing the same things over and over. You go to the, the same corner store every day yeah. and you get to like repetitively have that experience. Whereas when you're on tour, everything is new every single yeah. moment of the day. And it's like, I, I used to feel like that. I don't really, I haven't thought about that in a long time and I don't feel like I get into that state of mind even when I am traveling a lot now. But there is like a weirdness to coming home and having to be talking to people that are used to seeing the same thing over and over if you just spent two months of seeing some brand new shit every day because all of a sudden it's like a lot harder to get your your excitement level peaked once you've been on tour yeah. long enough. Yeah, it's kind of like a high, you know? Yeah. Like you're like, you come down when you're at home, you know? You're like, damn, man, that was so fun. Like, we were just on tour with this band and going to all these cool places and man, when's the next one going to be, you know, here I'm, here I'm back in the pad and, you know, it's just like, you know, for me, I didn't have anything to do until I got to the, till the next tour came up. So right. luckily the video and, uh, and the photography thing came up to keep me going, you know, in between tours. Cause a lot of tour managers, they just would call another band that they knew and they would book another tour while they were on the last one. So right. like the last tour, the last week of that tour, they were calling and advancing all the shows, setting up the travel and, and doing all that shit for the next band, for the next tour. Mm. But I didn't really feel like I could go on a bus for a month or two with new people. Like every time we came on to off tour, you know, like right. it was cool with the homies because we all knew each other. And, then, you know, it's like you're living with, you know, six, seven, you know, 12, 13 guys on one bus at one time, you know, on some of the tours. And that shit is crazy, you know, 13, you know, seven men on a little ass bus. And, you know, there's, you know, 
it's tight quarters. It's so. funny when I think about being young, like for me, it was like going on BMX bike trips and everything. But early in my life, I would have gone on the road with anybody. Yeah. And then like once you get to a certain point, like where I'm at now, I would not go on a trip with anyone unless I was super tight with them. Like I, yeah. I would just not be able to like, why, why am I even going to spend time with somebody unless I really, really fuck with them? Yeah. So I feel, I feel you. Cause it's like, if you're really on tour with one of the biggest rap groups in the world and they're your boys and they're from roughly where you grew up and yeah. you have so much in common, like what, what you're just going to hop on tour with some other band that you have nothing in common with. It's probably got to feel so stale and shitty yeah. and embarrassing, you know? Yeah, like, and we grew up together, you know, because yeah. we're all, like, in our early 20s, and now we're traveling the world, and you learn so much traveling, you know? You learn so much about, you know, people and culture and and about, you know, the people you're with right. and yourself. So, you know, we did a lot of growing up together in those years that we were doing all this, and we really became like brothers. And, you know, there's a lot of times where, we're tripping out on shrooms or something like that. And, you know, you get all emotional. You start talking about, you know, growing up with your family and you're, you know, bonding. You're talking about, you know, your relationship with your with your parents and shit like that. And you're just like tripping out on shrooms. You're like, damn, man. Yeah. You know, and you become like, you yeah. know, more brotherly and you're cool. And and um, then when it's over, you're just like, damn, man, you know, like I want to get back out on the road with my brothers, you know. And mm. I, I toured with two other bands. Um, I toured with a, a group called Proper Grounds. They were uh, the first band signed to Madonna's label. Wow. And then the second band was Candlebox. And, oh, wow. And I uh, did their first tour. The first tour with Proper Grounds was with uh, Danzig. Oh, and yeah. And then uh, Candlebox, we did like a promo tour. You get to actually spend any time around Danzig? Uh, not too much. They were, you know, like yeah. like the House of Pain. We were the lower band on the yeah. on the bill. So, you know, the the headliners. Another thing I learned too from going on tour with all these different bands is you would see how headliners would treat other bands, and they kind of treat everybody like shit. Mm. And that was one thing that we never did. You know, we always were cool with everybody. We let you know other bands kick it with us and. You know, sometimes we'd let, them, we'd let them come in our dressing room and hang out with us. And, you know, we try to make it like a more friendly environment because you're with each other mm. all day, every day for, you know, one to two months. So we didn't want to have because we noticed when we'd go on the road with these bands and the guys would be kind of stuck up mm -hmm. that, you know, we're like, fuck, man, I can't wait to get off the get off the road with this fucking lame, you know. <laughs> so we learned from those experiences like, hey, man. We're gonna be with these people. We don't know them. We're gonna, you know, let's make the best of it. And we'd party together, hang out. We'd go in the, you know, different cities together on the off days and shit like that. And it was cool, you know. What was it? If you had to identify the main thing, what was it that made Cypress Hill work long term in terms of being a band that toured together for that long that could still tour together now, versus House of Pain where it just sort of fizzled out real quick? Um the relationships you know like mm -hmm. the you know um one thing about be real and sin and mugs is they they know how to get along with pretty much everybody and that's one thing that you know like they just knew how to treat people and like we'd be running through the airports and a kid would recognize Be Real and, and be like, yes, and try to say like Cypress or whatever. He couldn't even say it. He was so excited. And the and the air, airline ladies are running with us. They're like, come on, let's go, let's go. And we're like, the kid would be like, can't get And, you know, he couldn't even say it and B would stop. And the lady would be like, oh, no, we're not going to make it. But B would take the, you know, the extra second to sign the thing for the kid. And you could just see like it just made the kids, you know, wow. whole life that day. So I just watch B and, you know, watch the way he would do interviews and watch how both of them, you know, would treat people. And, uh, you know, Muggs was, a, you know, a sick businessman. You know, mm -hmm. I learned a lot off of him. And because th those two guys were the ones that were more in the front, you know. So, you know, you just learned that for me, I always learned by watching people, you know. That's the way I learned the most from watching others do do good or do bad. And. I would watch those guys and they, you know, they knew how to treat people and everybody liked them. Everybody, you know, they treated everybody with, with respect. 
and everybody liked that shit, you know? Yeah. Like, you know, nobody wants to be treated like shit, you know, just because you sold more records. Mm. You know, like, oh, I sold, you know, a couple more records than you, so I have the right to treat you like shit now, you know? Like, that's not cool, you know? And Definitely. A lot of bands, you know, people, they act like that, you know, and their their managers breed that shit in them, you know, like, hey, you know, you can't be around this, this, you can't be around people too much, you guys kind of got to be mysterious mm. and, you know, create this thing, and it's like, they make it to where they can't even go in a fucking store or whatever, you know? Right. It's like, that, what kind of life is that, you know? You have all the money in the world, but you got to hide in your house. Yeah. Like, I'd rather be like, fuck it, you know? I'll have my little change, and I'll be able to go everywhere. Yeah. No, I feel it. Um, okay, so as the Cypress Hill thing winds down, you start to, like, where, where do you take things from there? And did it, like, you know, when I think about, like, some of your most iconic stuff, would you say that, like, a lot of your most iconic moments kind of came after uh, that time spent on the road with Cypress Hill? When I'm thinking about, like, the Eminem stuff that you guys did and everything like that, do you feel like you actually kind of took it to a different level after you stopped being on the road with them all the time? Well, yeah, I had to, you yeah. know, because I... Uh, it was like it was just about me now you know it was no more i had a job and they were creating the work for me because you know they had a tour to go on so i had to do my my job on those tours well now i'm just left by myself you know on the side of the road so it was like i had to figure it out for myself i had to get my own work and i had to use all the hustle that i learned from doing all that work and meeting all those people because since I was the, the tour manager, I set up all the press with the bands. So the, the record label would fax me a sheet, you know, and be like, hey, set up these four interviews tomorrow for the guys, you know, an hour, you know, give them an hour. Each each uh, interview gets 15 minutes. So from that, I learned, you know, like how to work quick because I'd watch these photographers. I, they're like panicking, you know, they're like, fuck, the, the interview took 10 minutes. So I got five minutes before this fucking asshole comes and kicks me out, which was me. And, you know, I got to make these classic photos that are going to be on like, you know, four to 10 pages of this group that's selling 20 million records. So I was, I'd was i be watching them going like, fuck, them dudes are having to come out with it quick, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I would see that, see them kind of like bummed out. So I would tell the people from the magazines, I was like, hey, if you need any photos of them on stage, live on stage or, or backstage, you know, just kicking it, life on tour, I got those. And they would look at, uh, you know, these pictures that I had that I'd bring up and bring with me. And they're like, hey, yeah, we'd like to use some of those. So then I started getting relationships with magazines and learning the lingo that they would talk. And, and so by the time that I was done going on tour with the bands, I had already, you know, been working with different editors, of magazines. And I had a photo agent in um, L.A. and I had a photo agent in, in uh, Japan. So I would call him up and be like, hey, is it cool if I come out for a month? You know, can you book me some stuff? He goes, yeah, you know, let me see what I could do. So I, he would book me like a couple of editorials for magazines, a couple album covers, and I'd come home with, you know, some money and it would be cool, you know. So, you know, I learned a lot from what I was doing and applied it to every point in my life after that, you know. Mm. Like I learned a lot about the merch dealing with the doing the merch for Cypress Hill. So I applied that to our clothing companies that we do here. I learned about, you know, how to market and promote, you know, how they market and promote our records. We we did the same thing. With, we did a tattoo tour in Japan, me and Cartoon. We went to 13 cities and spent five days in each city. And we'd promote it like a, like a record, you know, we had little, um, little posters we'd put up on the telephone poles. So and what were you actually doing in Japan for five days each city? That's a long-ass trip. He would tattoo, and I would take pictures and film. Hell so yeah. we're, we're thinking of doing a documentary on, you know, a Chicano from L.A. tattooing Chicano culture on Japanese kids, right. you know, in Japan. And then, you know, we saw it just get way bigger than that, you know? So we're like... We can't just keep it that, you know. We, we have a huge story here. Yeah. And when it came time to do the documentary, we had like 300 hours of footage that, you know, we gave to the editors, and they're like, "Fuck, man, what do you want us to do with this?" You know. 
go ahead have fun you know right start start picking through it does that kind of blow your mind to see the extent to which your culture that you grew up around can somehow resonate with different cultures like in particular in japan like i, I think i told a story on the podcast before but i remember being out there and like seeing like low riders and motherfuckers out there being like, look, like, just like in L.A. And I'm like, yeah, like, yeah. y'all are really driving this shit around every day. I'm like, there's not that many people in L.A. are driving that shit around every day. That's insane that you guys love L.A. shit that much. Like, like, how does that feel sometimes to see how far that shit reverberates? I mean, it's 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 great, you know, like I to me, I, I look at it. I'm just like, fuck, man, that's so cool. Like these people love our culture so much that they they bought that shit from yeah. the United States, had it flown over there, whether it was clothing, cars, whatever, tattoos, you know, whatever, whatever it was, they flew all that shit to their country and had, had it right there. They had like little mini LA's right there. Yeah. The only difference that they didn't have that we had, because for them it was more like a sport. It was like friendly competition. Mm. They didn't have people jacking them for the Dayton's. They didn't have the cops, you know, fucking with them because a lowrider is basically an illegal car right the car the the wheels are too small for it the suspension everything about it the unsafe storage of batteries in the trunk there's like three violations just pulling the car <laughs> just out of your by driveway. existing yeah. yeah so you know back in the 90s the cops used to always fuck with us it was like the thing to do you know like you saw a cop you're like oh mm. yeah the car could get towed. I, I might have a warrant. Could go to the, you know, could go to the county jail the night or whatever. But they didn't have to deal with none of that shit, you know. Mm. So them, it was just like it, it was cool, you know. They could just build cars and and basically, you know, drive them around, play with them all day, and nobody would fuck with them. Right. For them, it was like people would stop in the street and go, "Whoa, look at that fucking car going by." Yeah. You know, like whereas here, like motherfuckers are like, hmm. I wonder where he lives, you know? Like, that fool might have some rims that I need for my car or some shit like that. Like, I've gotten followed before, before my car, you know, and that shit is, you know, a little bit stressful, you know? You're like, what are these dudes going to do, you know? Yeah. So, you know, the cops fucking with you, taking, impounding your car, shit like that. Like, they don't got to deal with none of that. So it's kind of like they get to do it all, but in a safe way, you know? Right. They don't have the... But to me, I like I like it here. You know, I like the I like that little excitement, that stress, and you know, the adrenaline right. of it all. Has there ever been a point in your life where you started to feel like I got a little too much success to really be in the hood or around the shit that you know you really built the name for yourself on being around? Like, is is there ever that separation for you? Because sometimes, you know, we'll be doing video content where we just pull up to the projects, pull up to some rapper's hood, whatever. And to me, I love that feeling of just being accepted in that environment, being able to document this shit, knowing that it's very hard for most people to get into this environment. Um, but then at the same time, sometimes I think like I'm taking a little bit more risk than maybe would be wise to at times when I realize, you know, somebody got shot on, at that store where I was standing, you know, a week later or some shit like that. Yeah. I mean, back in the day, the, the most of the, the photos that I was getting were were people I was kicking it with. Right. So I was just there, you know, we were all there and yeah. I just happened to be taking pictures. Now, like, you know, some people know me and stuff, you know, like you said, but now if I'm going to do some photos or something like that, I'm, I'm being invited, mm -hmm. you know? So it's like, I'm a guest, you know, and people are cool, you know, as long as you're respectful and you're, you know, mm -hmm. you're not trying to act some t certain type of way you you know you you know how to navigate through all that you know mm. so for me it's like it's it's pretty much the same like i don't think i'm that successful to where people like I, people would want to be a threat to me you know mm. I, I don't have anything to really offer them like my success is that i've been seen right. you know or my photos have been seen and not like I'm a millionaire walking around or, or I'm, you know, on Instagram with, you know, 20 grand in my hand acting like it's a phone and shit like that. Like, right. that's not me, you know? Definitely. I just get, you know, pay my bills and do my thing. And so whenever I see people out there, you know, I go everywhere by myself pretty much. Right. And, and I, I feel comfortable like that, you know? I don't, I didn't put it to where I need to roll around with people or, or, 
you know, maybe, a, you know, I could be in some type of danger where I have to have somebody with me or anything. I, I, I never thought we, we always roll like that. Like, you know, even with Cypress Hill, we used to go everywhere. You know, every time we'd go to a new city, we'd just roll out, go to the mall, go kick it, kick it with people. You know, we were, like, friendly with everybody. Right. So we never had that, like, well, we sold this many records, so we got to act like this. And, you know, it's just a, a weird, there's, like, a thin line that you can cross. But once you cross that, you know, you're stuck on that side. Yeah. And none of us ever really crossed that line. I feel you. So you, as a photographer, in terms of, you know, obviously if you get paid to shoot something, then you're getting paid to shoot something. But in terms of the, the type of photography that really makes you happy, what are your favorite things if you had, you know, next Saturday free and you were going to, you know, go shoot something? What would be the thing that would bring you the most personal happiness to shoot? I mean, pretty much anything that you can't get paid for. You know, like all the stuff that I shoot that I never got paid for that, that I don't make money on is like the the stuff that I love to shoot you know the car culture the LA culture the you know the tattoo stuff you know that's all the stuff that I love to shoot that you can't really make money off of right it's the music and the celebrities and the brands that's where you get the money if anything people will see your style of photos and be like I want that style for my brand but you can't make somebody's brand look like that you know uh -huh. like those pictures were taken of a moment and it wasn't for a reason or a purpose so you're never going to get that again in a brand or you know like i I've, I've seen people go they look through my pictures and go oh, i want my album cover like that you know mm. but it's like you don't look like that you know? <laughs> and you're not that you know yeah. so it's like i'll do something nice for you don't trip i got you but you know I can't tell them like you know. Oh, you'll never be that guy. You know, don't don't even trip. So I just go, yeah, yeah. We, you know, we'll hook it up. And then I, you know, I take good enough pictures of them to where they're like, you know, yeah, you did your thing, you know. But they see other pictures and be like, man, I want to be that guy. Right. You know, it's like you're not that guy. But so much of your photography is just, I mean, so much of photography in general, but in particular, the stuff that I see from you and stuff that people love so much is that it's just very much a documentation of real people doing real things and like that's the thing that you can't really you know like like so much of photography really is access like i, I have some friends uh who have like you know had certain moments in time where their photography was getting attention and stuff and so much of that time when i would look at it from a technical standpoint it was very basic but they were in an environment where they were capturing insane things you know like just seeing shit that people don't get a chance to see and that's so much of what you know there's only so much that somebody gives a fuck about seeing a, a photograph that's technically well done. There's only so many people that are really going to be able to appreciate that. But having access and being around people, I, you know. Yeah, for me, moments. I see that and I think like, man, too bad that guy wasn't better, you know? Mm. Like I look at those pictures and I'm like, fuck, he was right there. He, he could have got a great one, you know? Right. He had the right access. He had the right, right guy, but, you know, he framed it wrong or he fucking... You know, there's something wrong with it, you know, like maybe there's like a telephone pole coming mm. out of the back of his head or some type of shit that you're just like, man, you know, almost, brother. Mm. You know, you almost got it. You know, the access is cool. That'll get you there. But it's like what you do when you get there, you know. Right. It's, that's the that's the trick to it. Yeah, because I mean, that's like from the way you talk about it, it sounds like you just have a lot of real respect for the fundamentals and that like you can you can take a lot of creative uh, leaps and stuff. But when it comes down to the the real structure of how the photo is supposed to be taken, which I guess it kind of makes you, uh, you and Cartoon's relationship make sense. Cause like when you look at his tattooing, it's like he could be tattooing anything, but it's done in a certain way. And that's kind of what gives it its appeal. Yeah. Yeah. Like I've seen him blow my mind. Like, you know, like when I brought up, you know, you could have him draw a lion or, or Saturn or whatever. Yeah. Like we've been in Japan and the dude says like, I want a lion you know just a lion head right here and he'll just get the sharpie out and just start going at it you know like maybe look at a reference picture but not make a pattern you know just do this lion you're just like damn man he just like came out of the head with that shit mm. and i seen him draw like some guy wanted the planet the planet saturn on them i'm like 
He, there ain't no way he's, he's going to need to get an encyclopedia for that shit. There ain't no way he's going to come out of the head for that one. And he did. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, where did he see? He must have saw that when he was like nine years old in history right. in elementary school and just remembered it. And now is the time that he just brought that shit out. And he killed it, you know? So, like, we, like, our whole crew, we try to always do our best when we're doing something because, you know, we have a name to, to carry, you know? Right. And they always say, like, you're only as good as your last thing. So, you know, basically we're kind of in competition with ourselves. you know? Like, if, if, my, if I'm only as good as my last thing, then I got to do better than my last thing, you know, my last photo shoot. Right. Because if I if I don't, then people will be like, oh, man, that fool, he's stuck. He's not growing or he fell off. Yeah. So you always got to be evolving and doing better and better and like pushing yourself, you know. So, I mean, the shit is, uh, you know, 20 years into it. You're like, well, what am I going to do now? You know, what's my next move? Right. But, you know, you you get around creative people and you, you never lose that 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 drive and that that momentum. Yeah, no, definitely. It feels like, especially with you, you've kind of like reached a, a level where in terms of both the documentary and the, how, how many years ago did you put this book out? Um, this book was, I think, uh, at the end of 2018. Okay. But is that like a newer impulse that you've had to be like, I want to create big big pieces of content that will like really epitomize my career? Because like this book, 50 years from now, somebody in your family when you're gone will still be able to look at that book and be like, this is an explanation of, of who you were as a person. And same thing with the documentary. When did you start to really feel like I want to have these big milestone achievements that will, that will document my existence for everybody? Well, the first book I put out was called LA woman. And I have some photos in there that were 20 years old. Yeah. So at that point I was thinking like, well, what other genres do I have that I could put out? books in 20 years old you know 20 years worth of photos because to me i think that if you do a book the respect of the book culture is that it should be an archive of of photos for a certain amount of period of time mm. like i've gone to afghanistan with my friend david cho i was there for three days during the war and we you know went in you know through the backside with some afghani people and he went and did a bunch of art there and I went and done a bunch of photos and the amount of shooting I did in those three days was probably like a month's worth if I was here. Mm. So I was like, man, you know, like people are like, oh, you should do a book of, you know, your trip to Afghanistan. But to me, I'm like, there's no way I can do a book of three days right. of photography. Like that's disrespectful to the book culture for, for, for photography books. But I could do a zine, maybe, you know, something like cool little zine, but I wouldn't want to disrespect the book world and do like, you know, three days of shoot, you know, for a book. So all my books have 20 to 25 years worth of photos and archives, like uh, L.A. Woman, then there was L.A. Portraits, which had like gangsters and lowriders, and then this one is um, 25 years of all the different stuff I've shot in L.A., from right. the celebs to the music to the gangsters, low riders, you know, street life, women, a little bit of everything. Right. And the next ones I have is uh, taking some of these sections and doing books on them, like a hip hop book, um, a low riding book, another LA woman book. So my next ones are going to be, uh, my very next one that's coming out in Christmas is going to be on this. Uh, it's called uh, Bozozoku. It's it's a motorcycle culture from Japan. They they there's uh, young guys and girls that uh, build these crazy custom bikes, and then uh, I'm gonna probably release that one for Christmas. Then uh, I was thinking of doing LA Woman two for Valentine's Day, and then uh, low riding worldwide for uh, Cinco de Mayo, and uh -huh. then you know just to because I have all you know so many pictures that I don't know what to do with them all. Like, I want people that like be able to check them out because people are always hitting me up on the DM like, hey, you should do a book on this and you should do a book on that or when when are we going to see this or that? And right. So I'm like, well, you know, don't trip out, you know. 
I'll get to it, you know. So I told the publisher, and he's like, you know, you want to pump them out, we can pump them out, you know, because he, he knows that I proved to be able to move them for him so he's not losing. Right. So that's been, you know, that's my uh, my latest thing, especially through the COVID, you know. Right. It wasn't. I kind of slowed you down a bunch. Yeah, I have, I've probably done, like, I think five photo shoots. Really? Since March like paid gigs yeah. so but i've shot everything everything i wanted to shoot in those months but as far as paid work i've only done like five jobs you know so wow i had to figure out other things to do so started working on the books the movie came out my my website you know started getting some momentum so i started making more merch and that's kind of what's kept me alive through the whole thing is doing merch and uh doing collaborations with Companies like Cookies and uh, Born and Raised and Fools Gone Wild and my homie uh, Cholo Fit Creeper, you know, so those little collaborations kept shit going during these times. That's interesting to hear you talking about that. So, okay, just the Fools Gone Wild one in particular, like, how do you feel? I just had Sad Boy Loco in here and I was talking to him about it the other day, too. Uh, what is your feeling on that? Because it seems like in a lot of ways... The culture that you're describing kind of gets ignored by like the mainstream and shit and food's gone wild it's just this unbelievable job of like explaining a culture to you in such a way that like you know, a lot of people would never have any idea about what was going on in this world and like it's crazy to see it represented through an instagram account how do you how do you feel about the crazy growth that they've had um you know i think they deserve it you know they mm. they they put a lot of work into it and they stuck to you know they stuck to their their thing and if you stick to something you're consistent with it you know the chances are it might take off you know if you mm -hmm. believe in it and they've stuck you know it's, it's a comedy you know so they've stuck with with their way the, this whole time you know mm -hmm. ever since day one when i started seeing it i was like oh man that's just funny because <laughs> you know they're not clowning like the whole culture they're just clowning like certain individuals within a culture and like you know, a lot of people can relate to those people that right. are in there you know that's like maybe oh that's one of the home that's just like one of the homies or that's like my cousin or that's like my you know someone in my family so people can relate to them that's why it's funny to them you know mm -hmm. that's why they can enjoy that shit because you know, there's some guys that are like, man, fuck that. Them motherfuckers are clowning, uh, clowning us. I'm like, they're, they're not clowning you. You do that, you know? Yeah. Are you out there doing that shit? And they're not clowning you. Right. They're clowning, you know, a couple of fools that you know, like spun out or whatever. But you know, that's always what comedy's been. You know, it's been like taking a look at your your culture and la and your life and being able to laugh at things. Mm -hmm. You know, and that that helps you get through shit. Yeah. So. You know, comedy's been like that for everybody in every culture, so why can't, you know, there be something for this culture, you know? Mm. Like, everybody should be able to take a joke or, you know, have fun or have a laugh, you know? Some people can't take the joke. I've heard people threatening the Food's Gone Wild owners' lives on yeah. social media before, which is, I was like, wow, I did not realize it was going to get to that point. Well, they get like that with me if I post something on, you know, like, that I went to a protest or some shit and I took mm. pictures. They're like, what are you doing out there? You're fucking supporting this or supporting that. Fuck this, fuck that. I'm like, yeah, whatever. You know, it's just like... Well, that that's an interesting fact right there because, I mean, you know, five, ten years ago, it's like the, the Hispanic vote was like very reliably democratic and that's been one of the weird things to see pop up is that... Yeah. A lot of Hispanic people came out in support of Trump. And yep. it's like, in, in a way, as much as I'm adamantly anti-Trump, I mean, that that is kind of symptomatic of Hispanic people taking ownership over their political beliefs and being able to say, like, you know, this is how we feel about it. We're not just going to vote in uniform for the party that says that they're representing us. Yeah, they're, they're threatening you over some sh some fool that never they never met before. Right. Either side, whatever side you pick, like... You're over here willing to threaten a motherfucker's life cause over some guy that you don't even know, right. that don't give a fuck about you, really. If you walked in, like if I walked into a restaurant and both of them dudes were in there, yeah. both of them would be looking at me like, what the fuck? I hope this motherfucker, I hope they don't sit him next to me. <laughs> you know, like neither one of them would trip out on me. Right. And neither one of them, if I asked them, hey, you can you do this for, you know, our people? Or then they'd be like, yeah, right, okay, yeah, sure. Mm. They wouldn't give a fuck, but... 
you're you know you have people that are they're they're fighting that hardcore over that shit you know like people actually like getting out of their cars and hitting girls and shit like right. that and or fucking up people like that they don't know over some shit that they don't even know the, those people and those people don't give a fuck about them you know so it's like what are you doing you know but when you go to shoot the protest you found the protest inspiring like what was the emotions that you were experienced going out there and how do you feel about it for me i was going out there as a as a photographer, somebody that was documenting what was happening at those times, because I was there in the 92 riots. Right. Like, I was there in that shit. And I had, like, uh, throwaway cameras, you know, like disposable cameras, but I didn't really take no pictures, and I kicked myself in the ass now, because mm. that was the first time I had ever seen tr tanks rolling down fucking Melrose Boulevard wow. with, with a b fucking bunch of army men you know, walking down Sunset Boulevard telling motherfuckers, go home, go in, go in the house, or, you know, you're going to get arrested. Like, right. shit, the whole city was burning. You know, you, you look outside and you see burning, like, clouds everywhere in the city. Then you turn the news on and, you know, people were getting pulled out of the cars and getting beat down and all kinds of shit. And you're like, you know, I didn't have no pictures of that, but I was there. I lived it. So when this was coming around, I was like, I'm going to get my pictures this time just for whatever so the first time we went out it was like uh you know when they were riding and burning shit down and we took pictures of all that then it was the cops came and it was like the standoffs then it was uh the protests or like you know peaceful protesting or no then it was the national guard mm -hmm. then came the peaceful protesting and so I, I wanted to capture all the different elements of what was going on in these times along with the covid you know people rolling around with masks mm -hmm. all the stores boarded up the stores that got looted and burned down and i just wanted to you know document it all because i feel like for for history or for people that you know yet to come these photos are what document these times mm -hmm. you know like there's the history books that we grew up to and we saw as as kids and we 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 learned about in school that you you're hearing all this shit that's you know saying that that's all bullshit so it's up to us now to make the new history books for generations to come it's interesting like can you as a photographer go and shoot photos of something like like a political movement or a protest do you have to be in favor of the the protests that you're taking photos of like if there was a nazi rally in down downtown la tomorrow is that the kind of thing that you would feel comfortable photographing i mean no. this is clearly as a photographer yeah. certainly of note but yeah I, I would definitely go shoot it but i wouldn't feel comfortable there mm. like i went to shoot you know different political uh things going on here like i went to shoot you know all the people uh, you know for trump right there in beverly hills oh yeah okay and, I, you know, of course, I go by myself and um, right away, the, you know, you feel the way the people are looking at you. Mm. You know, you're like, damn. Because they're looking at you like you're you're not on our side. So you yeah, must be like, against us. Yeah. Like, how, you know, like I, what did I have to do to wear like a, you know, red hat? And <laughs> if you did, you know, then you would have probably like a, everybody would have accepted you right like away. A tank top <laughs> with a flag or something like yeah. that. Like I just dressed the way I dress every day. I wasn't going to change up just to go take pictures, you know? Mm. So, like, I, I kind of noticed, like, right when I got there, people were, like, you know, looking at me in a certain kind of way. So then I was like, you know, oh, this this might not turn out too good, you know? Especially because I'm outnumbered. I'm by myself. Mm. And if somebody trips on me, I'm not the guy that'll just walk away and you're going to fucking be throwing shit at me or none of that, you know? Like, I'm going till the wheels fall off, so... right. I saw how the cops were, you know, supporting them and they're like, you know, they kind of could do whatever they wanted to anybody and the cops would just like be, like, you know, right. You know, turn the fucking but at the other kind of uh protests like the Black Lives Matter or whatever the kids in cages type one, the cops were, you know, they were on it, you know. Right. They're like if you're not on this side then we're fucking you up. Mm. And you know, I, me and, uh, you know, a couple of people I rolled out with, they, we all got shot, rubber bullets, you know, the, the, the paint guns with the pepper spray. You actually got hit? Ass. Yeah. Wow. We Serious got, injury or anything? Or? Uh, one of my boys, he got shot in the head, you know, gushing blood. I, I didn't know what, you know, I didn't know the damage. I just saw 
a face full of blood, so we rolled into uh, Cedar Sinai because I figured, man, if we go to the hospital here in the hood, you know, I don't know what happened to him. I, he might fucking bleed out or something. So I took him to Cedar Sinai. I learned from another homie that, you know, you just drop him off right there at the emergency room, and and they have to take care of him. Right. And it's a different mentality at the at you know a hospital like that. So. We rolled over there and they they hooked them up right away and we were out of there in a couple of hours. Wow. But you know it gets it gets pretty rough. You know I, I had a couple of friends that were vets that went with us, you know out there and I tripped out when when the cops started shooting the non-lethal things that or whatever at us. Right. He would just stand there and just be like, you know these aren't real bullets, so you know what the fuck's gonna happen? You know yeah. he'd been on the front lines over there. So you see footage of of all of all of everybody, and as soon as they start, you know, shooting at you, everybody runs and scatters. Right. And then you'll see like one guy standing there, and that's that's my boy who had done a couple been tours in, over there. I've been in that situation a couple of times where you hear gunshots go off at a party or whatever, and it's like ninety five percent of people just hit yeah. the ground or run for cover and they'll always be that's how you know who the crazy motherfuckers are is like the dudes who are just don't care don't duck down whatever yeah. even though realistically like running for cover usually doesn't make a ton of sense mm -mm. in that environment because it's like you don't know where the what angle it's coming you don't know where it's being shot at chances are is it's a guy shooting at another guy that are not pointed at you at all yeah. but yeah, it, like, I mean, I've been at mad parties and stuff where somebody pulls out a gun and you just see, like, a wave of people crashing yeah. down, and it's fucking crazy. It's crazy. Like, all all those, like, internet things when they shoot in the clubs, like, you just see, like, yeah. everybody trampling each other, you know? And, um, you know, like you said, you know, you just see that one guy who's just, like, just yeah. not, not afraid of anything. They're just watching everything that's happening. They're like, yeah. okay, who's the shooter, you know? And where... Where is this coming from and where is he aiming to? Mm. And they just are watching that shit. Like sometimes, you know, you're just running with the crowd, but then you'll look and you'll see that one guy watching everything and mm. you just see what he's looking at and you look and you're like, okay, that's where it's coming from and that's what's happening, you know? You know, it's interesting what you're saying about the protests too because nowadays it's almost like a lot of people at a protest are going to, see a camera and immediately feel very suspicious and take offense to it almost because there's like a assumption that on certain side of that that somebody might just get fired from their job for being associated with it one way or another or a lot of times people on the left and in antifa whatever you hear them talk about how nobody should be live streaming at protests and whatnot because you know that and that's just going to be used against them yeah um do you feel any responsibility in that or have you seen that mentality change over the years sort of yeah, and I, I I shoot on film, you know. Yeah. And nobody's gonna see these pictures for at least ten years. Yeah. All my pictures that I've shot, you know, and these things that they won't be seen for ten, twenty years. Just like everything that everybody's seeing now is twenty years old. Right. So, for me, it's not like oh, let me shoot some cool stuff and get it out as fast as I can, and you know, faster than everybody else. You know, I'm like cool. Everybody's seen all that already. Everybody's seen those cop cars on fire. You know by 50 other people that were shooting it live that day or mm. posting on Instagram. So I don't even need to show mine now because everybody already saw that event happening. Right. So I just save all my stuff for something later on down the line that, you know, where I feel like, you know, it'll fit with what I do. Definitely. Um, it's interesting you say that, though, like sitting on a photo for 10, 20 years, it's like now a lot of people don't, want to wait you know a day to put something online like is it ever do you ever take an amazing photo and you feel like that might be one of the best photos i ever taken i want to get that out to people right away no you don't have that impulse no i feel like yeah like i i, I can't keep up there's no way because i i feel like i take a lot of good pictures you yeah. know because i the way I, the school i come from is you don't push a button until you see something good Whereas now they do like the spray and pray technique. Mm. They just hold their button down, just a brrr, you know, and they'll hopefully I'll get one out of there and then I could Photoshop it to death and it'll be a great picture. Mm -hmm. For me, I'm, I'm shooting like maybe 10% of what everybody else is shooting. And I don't really care because they, I already know that they beat me to the punch. Some mm. of these guys' uh, cameras are Wi Fi to their oh, phones. Yeah. 
and all the photos on the phones come up and by the time I get home I'm already seeing that fucking shit what they shot when I get home I'm like <laughs> I don't even need to put that picture out because all these I feel like that even at photo shoots that I mm. do like what's the point of even putting out my picture when when everybody behind the scenes posted everything yeah there's no there's nothing like no surprise yeah everything's been exposed already so i'm like fuck it you know yeah and it's crazy because now even as like a person who's primarily made a, a name for myself making youtube videos it's like sometimes you'll be getting a, a clip and then you realize like 10 people just got that on their snapchat and it's gonna go viral on instagram before i ever put this youtube video out even if it only takes two or three days for this youtube video to be edited it's like it's crazy trying to compete with that yeah this is it's, it's hard you know like yeah. one of the last campaigns i did i shot um Carucci's, um jewelry line oh wow we did it in in july in like the beginning of, or the middle of july and she just started posting it um a couple of days ago mm. and i think she went from like november 10th to the 14th she posted like you know a bunch of shots from the photo shoot but before that there was nothing which was cool you know that's that's like old school that's how mm. we used to do it like there's a there's a plan and this is how we're gonna do it not just like you know fast food like you know nobody from nobody even got to go on the shoot with us like it was, she goes hey you know all the the glam squad they all waited at the at the studio uh -huh. and then we went out in the car and drove around and went to locations and shot right so there was no behind the scenes so it was kind of cool you know so it was like when the shit did drop it was like old school like a campaign dropped and that's when you see everything do you feel like when you're shooting something like that that's sort of you know very much outside the type of stuff that you would typically be shooting you know from a cultural standpoint do you feel like what you're bringing to the table is also partially personality based like like how much of that matters to you like do you feel like you're getting something out of the person you're shooting that the average photographer might not be able to get just on a personal level yeah I'm, I'm hoping so you know because mm. i'm trying to you know for me i'm i've always been kind of competitive you know like in sports or whatever i was doing and to me it's like you know photography is just like a, it's a sport you know like who who can do the shit better and i'm always thinking like okay well like i always like to see pictures of people before like if they're you know pictures have been people that have been photographed a lot I like to see other pictures that they have because I don't want to do the same thing. You know, mm. I don't want to shoot them in the same place or shoot them with their same car or whatever. I want to shoot them completely differently. So I always like to, you know, check out how people have been shot before and be like, okay, cool. They've never been shot like this. And this still fits in within my style. Mm. So I'm going to do this. And it works. You know, I've I've ended up doing that for some artists you know like there's a lot of like some female artists most of their pictures are all you know beautiful colors mm -hmm. and lights and studios and shit like that and very rarely do you see them out in the street you know everything stripped down black and white in like you know uh you know kind of like a hood environment or industrial environment you know everything's kind of like uh candy coated yeah when, when you see the their photos and stuff so when they come to me, I'm like, okay, cool. They don't have nothing like like what I've done, so I'm gonna, you know, give them that. Definitely. Yeah. No, that's amazing. Um, when it came time for you to do the uh, documentary, what was uh, what made you want to do that? That was a little bit more immediate, you know. It gave you a chance to show a lot of your photography, but also to like include a lot of stuff, like you know, interviews that were just shot and shit. Like, how did you sort of adjust your mentality when normally you're taking photos, thinking about the long term so much? Um, well, we we'd been trying to shop that documentary for years, okay. maybe uh, ten years. It had already been shot, or just shop. Right. Yeah, like we we well a lot of we had a lot of footage at that time. Uh huh. And we were shopping in. We we shopped it to Lawrence Bender, who's um, uh, Quentin Tarantino's producer. And we shopped it to Brian Grazer and Ron Meyer, who you know do Imagine and Universal. And also uh, Chris Mills mm -hmm. wanted to wanted to put it out. So we were either going to go with you know Chris Mills, who's the homie. You know we could have done it like you know all the homies together, 
we could have done it with you know someone like uh Lawrence Bender who you know we love this the style of films that they put out or we could have done it with Brian Grazer who does you know like the master hits you know so at that and he wanted to do those two guys wanted to do a documentary and they wanted to do a feature uh -huh. so if we sign with them then we would like executive produce or maybe direct a feature with them but the documentary had to be put on the shelf so we did that we put out a movie called low riders we we're like the executive producers and the uh, consultants on that we basically got like the you know the made it look authentic you know with the cars and the locations and stuff like that and you know the style of of clothing and everything and then uh after that movie was done they gave us back our footage and i met a guy named uh, sebastian ortega who's a producer in argentina he was up here and and he was like uh he's the only one with a lowrider in argentina in buenos aires wow. so he was like hey man you know i got a lowrider you know down there in argentina and i was wondering what whatever happened with that documentary and i was like the funny you ask, you know, because we just got all that footage back and we got the rights to it. And he's like, can I do it? And I was like, yeah, if you want to, you know, he's like, come down to Argentina. I'll show you my facility, my, you know, my company. Mm. And if you feel like it's the right place, you know, let's let's go from there. So he flew me down there. I went and kicked it with him for, you know, maybe 10 days. And um, me and him got along real good. Like, I felt like this was the perfect guy to put this movie out because he was a lowrider and he understood our culture. You know, most of the other people in the movie industry, they're not, they never been in a lowrider. They don't know what it feels like and they don't have no tattoos. He rolls around with like Chucks, Dickies and a white t-shirt. Mm -hmm. He's the head exec at this company down in Argentina. So I was like, man, he's a perfect guy. He gets it, you know, he's gonna let us do our thing. He's not gonna, you know, butt in and make us do any corny shit. And this is a perfect place. Yeah, it's a, you know, another side of the world, but fuck it, you know, we gotta do, you know, do it where we feel right. Mm -hmm. And we signed up with him. He already had a couple things on Netflix down in, uh, you know, Latin America. And we got a rough cut together and he showed it to Latin American Netflix. They showed it to the US headquarters and they're like, hey, you know, can we do this on a worldwide level? And, you know, of course, everybody's like, yeah, let's do it. So at first when the movie was coming out, it said, you know, a movie done about two guys from Los Angeles, you know, two Chicanos in Los Angeles, lowrider, you know, hip hop, tattoo culture. But the movie was made from Argentina. So people are like, damn, that's kind of crazy, you know, that... You had to go all the way down there to get your movie done, but that's kind of how it's been for us. You know, we've always had to go outside of here mm. to get shit done that we wanted to do. Definitely. Like they appreciated us more, you know, outside of here than in our own hometown. But what was the Netflix effect like just having it put out there on that scale? Because like, I didn't even know it was coming out and I just went to look at Netflix on some regular shit and I'm like, oh, what? Like, they got a fucking documentary out? And I'm sure for a lot of people it was very similar where Netflix is such a huge platform to, like, you probably had people coming out of the woodwork saying like, I didn't know what the fuck you'd been doing all these years and now I, I see it and I get it. Yeah, that's a, pretty much exactly what happened. Like we had a studio downtown and it had closed down. Right there were six partners and you know the business kind of like went different ways and we just all shut the door and we're like okay cool you yeah. guys go back to new york you guys go back to your corporate jobs me and cartoon will you know we'll go back to doing what we do and there was a couple of years where you know it was like we kind of like we're had to bounce back you know and get back on our feet we're we're in this huge building we had like three warehouses like this size you know next to each other I and mean, it was just booming you know it was like headquarters everybody had come there and it was just mm. like a scene it was like the the place to go if you want to get tattooed yeah we had like 10 lowriders in there it just looked crazy it was like a museum and then one day you know it comes to an end and it's over and it's like okay now what do we do you know and the way i wanted to sh do the movie is like have people thinking like well fuck what happened to them you know like the end of the movie just showed them 
closing the doors and the, the you know the business went away and it was over but in my head i was thinking like that's perfect you know that's what i want them to think is like well, i wonder what happened to these guys but in my head it's like you just you got the answer you just watched a, a movie on netflix you know that that's what happened mm. We went out and we did a, a fucking another bigger project, you know, right. than having a little studio and doing these little jobs. Like, we we did a movie, but they're like, no, no, it has to have these like, you know, different elements, like a, you know, middle, beginning, the end, and it has to have these roller coasters and it has to end like this. And we're like, all right, you know, we'll do it however you guys say we have to do it. And it ended up, you know, we compromised a little bit, but they gave. They gave us a little bit what we wanted, and we were all happy, and it came out good, you know. Uh, and right before the COVID, uh, before everybody got shut down, we were supposed to headline at the South by Southwest, and it was going to be us one night and uh, Spike Jones doing the uh, Beastie Boys the next night. Oh, wow. So, you know, we were having like 20 homies like Baldacci and Cholo Fit Creeper and all them were going to come out fly to, to Austin with us to South by Southwest and we're all gonna, you know, like 20 of us, we're just gonna all go there and kick it and have our movie come out and, you know, have this like big grand day and uh, a couple of days before they shut it down. Same here, we had a show book for South by, we were so excited about it, had a brand paying for the whole thing, last minute, nope. <laughs> yeah. So it was like one more time, we're like, fuck man, right when yeah. we get there and we think that shit's gonna be like, this is the one, this is gonna be the one that takes us, some shit happened and we're like, fuck man, this is like, you know, another time. And they're like, don't worry, don't worry. Everybody's gonna be stuck at home, this is perfect, you know? We're like, yeah, right, nobody gives a fuck, you know? Cause when Netflix does something, they just put it up. They don't do like, hey, you know, check out this Friday, this movie's gonna come out or put right. a trailer, like they just launch everything. Yeah. And whoever, people gravitate to and whatever gets you know snatched up that's what you know it starts getting trending yeah so luckily that shit took off and people started you know everybody started promoting it and watching it and like it organically just grew and started trending and it got into the top 10 and we we're like blown away like hey homie you see this shit yeah yeah fuck you guys are number 10 we're like damn you know because at that point it was uh tiger king yeah see i was gonna say i'm like that was your little tiger king moment <laughs> yeah so we're like damn you know we're we're coming we're coming for tiger king you know like mm. maybe everybody's tired of talking about it that shit and watching it and like maybe we, you know we can just slide in there and we watched it go from like 10 to like eight then back to nine then to six then back to seven then it got up to like f five and four we're like fuck you know like this is so like you know to me i was like blown away you know overwhelmed like fuck right. we would have never thought that Laura? this shit would have got to that point you know yeah like we thought it was cool and it was good like you know of course you feel like confident and stuff like that you're like yeah we got some cool shit in there we got eminem we got 50 cent mm. we got dre you know we got all this cool shit tattoos hip-hop low riding like some people are gonna trip out on this but we never, like, I I never would have thought we would have went to number 10, mm. number four, number one documentary. You know, I was like, fuck. Did man. that help blow up other parts of your business, like your book sales and shit start going crazy from there? That's what it did. Mm. You know, like, it that's it hit me right in the, in the website, you know. And luckily I had some shit because at that time, too, COVID had shut down. Right. So one of my warehouses shut down and stopped making shit. And then they shut, they stopped sending shit out online. So I had another place that I could take stuff to and they would ship it. They were like, hey, we make masks, so we're essential. The other place wasn't essential, so I was like, okay, fuck, here, here's my lane. I'm going to get all my shit and put it here. And, and I was just shipping mm. like, like never before. People were, when I went to look at the analytics, people were Googling my name going to my website, then clicking to my store. Yeah. Whereas I thought they were gonna all just hit me, cause I was talking about Instagram in the movie. I thought they'd all just hit me on the Instagram and that's where, you know, that's where it would be coming from. But it was a, it was a trip that people went those extra levels, mm. you know, those extra steps to get to me. And then they, you know, people were buying shit left and right. And I was like, fuck yeah, you know, this is like, you know, I couldn't ask for something better 
you know, this, I think it worked out better than if we would have went to the festivals and, you know, during the COVID, like all my, mm. cause before the COVID I had a couple of jobs lined up, but I had gotten paid for all the jobs that I had done. So everything that was lined up was going to be covering me till the end of the year. Once the COVID came, all those jobs got canceled. Mm. So I was stuck in March thinking about what the fuck am I going to do to, for the end of the year if I can't work? Cause there was no stimulus. There was no nothing. Mm. So in my head, I'm thinking like, man, I, you know, I'm going to have to, you know, be rationing my money, food, you know, it's kind of like a little panic, panic mode right there in the beginning. But then when the, when the movie dropped and, you know, online sales started popping, I was like, damn, you know, fuck. That's fire. This is going good, you know. Definitely. Um, I mean, having put out books like this, like compiling so many years of photography and having done the documentary, it's got to be a moment where you're like fuck like those are some of the biggest things that i could have done to really like document my shit like what what stands out to you now that could take it to another level um well right you know right now i'm just planning my you know the next my next book projects and uh you know i i got with a uh an agent you know uta so they're helping me get into you know different movie stuff um working on the cypress hill documentary oh wow we did a you know we're we're getting the sizzle reel together and that's much needed that's exciting hopefully you know get to you know do the cypress documentary and then do maybe a soul assassin documentary with you know our whole crew oh yeah and just expand on la originals you know on Go a so deeper, many more deeper, levels deeper, yeah because yeah. originally we wanted to start the other way you know, do soul assassins and then branch off. You know, mm. here's a Cypress doc, here's this doc, here's that doc. And it was just so hard to get everybody together, get everybody on the same page. And I was like, well, fuck it, let's just do one on us. You know, mm. we got the footage, we have everything. Let's just do our own. And we did that. And then and then the homies were like, hey, we should do one on this. We should do one on all of us. And, you know, and then it all started lining up. You know, when they saw, you know, the, the finished product, they're like, yeah, let's do this so now we're going with that you know we uh, had to do the cypress one and you know they they got they got such a crazy story you know and and they were advocates for the whole weed movement yeah. before it was cool nobody else was rapping about it it was like kind of like you know you don't really talk about smoking weed and we'd go into fucking corporate meetings at, at columbia and sony just reeking of weed every time we'd get out of the you know, the car services and shit, it looked like Cheech and Chong. Yeah. You know, the doors open, it's just like shoo, smoke, and everybody's like, <laughs> you know. Yep. Everybody on the streets in New York, and they're like, God damn, you know. <laughs> now everywhere in New York stinks like weed because you can yeah. just smoke on the street there. The whole city. That's you know? crazy. Yeah, everywhere. The world has changed. A lot. Yeah, that's true. Um, okay, yeah, that's, that's crazy, though. Just like, I don't know, it's, it's a very inspiring story, and I think... A large percentage of people out there, I think, could really like learn something because there's a lot of people out there that are, who watch my shit who are just trying to figure out how to make something out of their own creativity, you know. Yeah. And I feel like that's kind of the most inspiring thing about you is that you've managed to do that from super early on and continue to just sort of like reinvent the ways that you're doing that. Yeah. Now you know. Now we have people hitting us up. You know, before we didn't have that. We we had to hit them up. You know, we had to like come with these ideas and be like we really have to sell them on it you yeah. know now people are like hey can you do that for us mm. you know it's like we kind of made our own lane and people like what we do and they come to us for that mm -hmm. whereas before we'd have to like kind of kick the door down and like right. throw the shit on the desk and be like this is what you need you know we and we're your guys to do <laughs> it you know we had to like really sell it hard yeah and we had to you know May build their confidence that if they went with us that you know they were gonna that they did the right thing now it's like you know hey can you guys do that for us and we're like you know well your brand doesn't really fit with mm. with our what we do in our movement you know so maybe it'd be better to go to those guys you know they probably do it better than us or you know we can kind of pick and choose who we want to do stuff with and who we fit with because right. obviously we don't fit with every brand mm. and we can't make every brand fit with us so you know we just try to do stuff that that goes with the, goes with us you know stuff that we're into 
Definitely. Um, all right. I probably got to piss more right now than in my entire life. Uh, okay. Anything we should be looking out for? Uh, anything that we need to know about? Um, you know, we're just working on the, you know, the new documentary and some movie projects that we don't really like to put it out there until, you know, everything's set in stone and locked down. But, you know, I got the books coming, uh, those three books I was talking about, the Christmas and the Bozok and the L.A. Women for Valentine's Day and low riding for Cinco de Mayo. And, uh, you know, I got my gear online and, you know, basically that's all I can focus on right now while everything's you know we might get locked down again you know so i'm kind of just using what i have and putting that out there and then when they free it up then i can go because a lot of times i travel for work so when they free it up then i can go uh, the way i feel about it is i can get back to work you mm-hmm. know but right now i'm just doing all this stuff you know it's a lot of work too but it's not you know what i'm used to doing because i'm used to being out there traveling the world taking photos and you know doing all that but now i'm just focusing on what i can do here with what i got and um i got plenty of shit to do you know it's Fire. like you know like the the cliche you know there's never enough time in the day so i'm uh you know i'm good with that oh yeah you gotta let me buy that off you how oh, much you charge yours. you sure yeah, it's already got your name on it. Can't oh, sell it to nobody else. That's fire, man. I was just thinking, I'm like, I'm gonna have a good ass time looking at this tonight. Holy yeah. shit! Well, that's you, brother. No, this is this is amazing. Like, really, it's making me hope to someday be able to sort of uh, encapsulate a lot of what we've done here through a book or whatever. Because this is just having this. I just got so much respect for just having this fucking documentation of, of your whole culture, man. It's like it's really amazing, you know, because you you've got access to a lot of. Uh, a lot of the craziest stuff at a moment in time or moments in time that just, you know, nobody was else was really doing it to that extent. So, I mean, you might have to wait, like, you know, a certain amount of time to make your stuff feel special these days. But, like, a lot of the stuff that you got back then is, like, completely one of a kind. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. That's why that's the stuff I'm putting out now, you know. I'm, yeah. I'm grabbing my, my archives that have, you know, all the stuff from those times when there wasn't a camera in everybody's pocket that's the stuff i'm showing right now and then later on i'll show you know the stuff that i'm doing now aside from the you know the brand work or whatever right that i'm doing but my my own projects that i that i'm holding close i'll release those later on i just appreciate anybody who's like really truly in love with their city and documenting it and that's what's really dope is that you have that perspective on la you know yeah it means a lot I, I didn't notice it really until this last book came out. Like everything is like L.A., 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 LA yeah. like L.A. portraits, L.A. woman, L, you know, the, this is Los Angeles. Like, hey man, I didn't you. plan it till then until I, you know, I started looking. I'm like, fuck, man, everything's L.A. Like how is people from around the world going to relate to all this shit, you know? Right. It's like so L.A. Like, you know, it's it's probably like, um, you know, like shooting yourself in the foot kind of, you know, because you're just doing one part. But then I think like all the all these like L.A. and New York are are key places in the world that put out you know culture and creativity. Yeah. So you know you, you got to think of it like that. Like you know we're one of the, we're one of the the main spots that put out all this stuff. So yeah, man. No, this is an incredible book. I think everybody who's checking this out should definitely hit up your web store and order. Holy fuck! You got Kim K in here. Yeah, Kat um, Von D. A very, wow, Kat Von D looking far less tattooed. This is crazy. Yeah, everybody needs to go cop this shit for sure. Wow, Travis Barker in there, everything. Yeah, Skinhead Rob hooked me up with him. Okay, hell yeah. Yeah. Yo, thank you so much, man. And uh, where should they check you out on Instagram and what's your website and everything? I just keep it real simple. Everything's at Stevan Oriel. Okay. Stevanoriel.com, at a Stevan Oriel. You know, just keep it keep it simple for everybody keep it simple yeah this is los angeles all right man much respect thank you so much for your time thank you brother it means a lot oh uh, yeah no jumper coolest podcast on the world check us out on youtube soundcloud itunes like comment subscribe and hit nojumper.com if you want to support appreciate y'all